Reading 75 from the Psychological Commentaries on the Teachings of Gurdjieff and Ouspensky by Dr. Maurice Nicole, Volume 1, Berlitt, May 9th, 1943. Internal Considering and External Considering, 10, On Being Passive, Part 4, On Identifying with Oneself, Part 1. If you have to pass from one room into another room, it will be impossible to do so if you are fastened to something in the first room. Suppose you are stuck in your armchair. It will be impossible to move except with the armchair attached to you. And if the door is narrow, you will be unable to get through. And you must imagine that we are fastened to many things that prevent us from passing to a new level of being. I remember on one occasion that Mr. Ouspensky spoke of us as wearing an enormous number of coats. He said that it was necessary to strip off these coats one by one, otherwise we were too bulky to pass through the door. A person who believes in himself, in his virtue and merit and so on, is bulky in a psychological sense, so he cannot pass through the narrow gate, or through the eye of a needle. He is a camel. A camel is a big and obstinate creature. Of course, a person who is psychologically a camel is meant. In the Gospels, a person who is very much identified with himself is called a rich man. He has a firm idea of his own wealth, his own worth. <clears throat> he thinks that he knows. He is certain he can do, and is sure that right and wrong are clear to him. Such a person is very much identified with himself. This is the rich man of the Gospels, of whom Christ said it was, either for a, it was easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. In the case given in the Gospels, the rich man felt he possessed goodness and had obtained much merit in everything he had done. He was identified with himself, so all that he did went into the wrong part of himself. Because of this, Christ said to him, Go, sell all that thou hast. The rich man was sorry, for he had great possessions. That is, he was identified with himself and his value. Yet. He was not so much identified with himself as the Pharisee who prayed, saying, God, I thank thee that I am not as the rest of men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as the publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I get. While the publican prayed, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The Pharisee is an extreme example of identification with oneself. Let us clearly understand that a man may be very good in life and do his duty and follow all he is taught faithfully and meet danger with heroism and yet be the rich man of the Gospels. This means that he is identified with himself in all that he does and is satisfied with himself. Now you know that there is a phrase in the work which says that until a man reaches the stage of realizing his own nothingness, he cannot change. To begin to realize one's own nothingness is a practical experience. To begin to realize one's own nothingness as a practical experience is to begin to cease to be a rich man. In other words, it is to begin to cease identifying with oneself. Let us now speak of identifying with oneself from different sides. Let us begin by saying that where you are identified with yourself, there you cannot be passive to yourself. To be identified with yourself means that you are fastened to something in yourself which you take as yourself. Suppose you are fastened to the idea that you are a truthful person. 
This means that you are fastened to this picture of yourself. You picture yourself to yourself as being always truthful. So wherever you are, as it were, you take with you this picture. You have no existence apart from this picture. You are this picture. It accompanies you everywhere, no matter even if you are not telling the truth. This makes no difference to the picture that you have of yourself and to which you are firmly glued. If for a moment circumstances make you feel you are not being quite truthful on some occasion, then at once you will begin to justify yourself and explain and argue and so on until you feel again quite comfortable inside and at peace with this picture which dominates you. This is being identified with yourself. It is an example belonging to the class of identifying with pictures of oneself. Of course, pictures are legion, but everyone has special pictures of himself or herself with which he or she identifies. One of the sources of our inner disharmony and our negative states lies in pictures. When a picture is, as it were, touched, we show our touchiness either by being depressed or by being angry, or in short, negative. When we carry a great many pictures about, we are very identified with ourselves. And the more we are identified with ourselves, the more liable we are to be upset, discouraged, disappointed, and so on. Of course, it is not only pictures that make a person liable to be upset, but pictures form a very definite source of instability in ourselves. Pictures are formed out of vanity and imagination. That is, they belong to the false personality, which is imaginary I. And with everything belonging to the false personality, we are especially identified. If we could really see by direct insight that we are not at all as we imagined, then the power of false personality would be weakened. On one side we would lose, but actually we would gain far more than we would lose. But we always defend ourselves, even when we know better. This is because those two giants called pride and vanity will not allow us to yield, at least to others. And for this reason, only self-observation can help. You yourself, by seeing yourself, can yield to yourself. So a division must be made in oneself between the observing and the observed sides. And at first, everything must be observed passively and placed in the light of consciousness without criticism. If you have a picture of yourself as always being truthful, then you must observe over a long period how often you lie. Only this inner realization will destroy the power of the picture with which you have been identified and to which you have been a slave. Part three. So long as a man takes himself as one person, he will never move from where he is. Yes, but why? Because he is then completely identified with himself. His work only begins when he feels two men in himself. One is passive, and this is the man who observes. The other is active, and this is the man who is observed. This active man calls himself I. The passive man is the beginning of the path to real I. But it is for a long time weak and can do nothing. But as the feeling of I is drawn out of the active man, so does the passive man become strengthened until the time comes when the passive man becomes active and the active man passive. That is, a reversal takes place and the inner controls the outer, not the outer, the inner. Let us understand this more clearly. So long as a person takes himself as one, he cannot become different. Do you see why? He cannot change because he is identified with himself and takes everything in himself as himself. His thoughts, opinions, moods, feelings, sensations, and in fact everything he takes as I. He says I to them all. 
You will remember what the work says about identifying. I will quote a few things. Identification is so common a quality that for the purposes of observation it is difficult to separate it from everything else. Man is always in a state of identification and for this reason he cannot remember himself. Identifying is one of our most terrible foes. It is necessary to see and to study identifying to its very roots in oneself. Identifying is the chief obstacle to self-remembering. A man who identifies with everything is unable to remember himself. In order to remember oneself, it is necessary not to identify. But in order not to identify, a man must first of all not be identified with himself. He must remember that there are two in him. One that can only observe at first, and another that takes charge of him at every moment and speaks in his name and calls itself I. He must try not to identify with this other man who controls him and feel that he is different from him and that there is another in him. But unless this separation is made and continually made, he remains one man and nothing can change in him. You will see that the work teaches that the state of man is such that he identifies with everything. For example, a man identifies with his knowledge. One person has one kind of knowledge, such as knowledge of the world. Another has knowledge of science. A third, knowledge of cooking. A fourth, knowledge of business. A fifth, knowledge of books, and so on. But in each case, a person will identify with his or her knowledge. You know how people have similar knowledge quarrel and how in the so-called learned world, all sorts of extraordinary jealousies exist based on identifying. Doctors, for instance, always disagree, and they are always identified with their knowledge. Cooks also do not agree, nor do literary people, nor soldiers, nor parsons, nor mothers, and so on, and so on. Perhaps you remember in childhood when you first began to identify with knowledge, and how pleased you felt when you were told something that others did not know and felt a kind of power. Identifying gives a sense of power. It was not, of course, the knowledge you were interested in, but the fact that you could show off. Now, let us take the subject of identifying with intellectual center. Here exist, among other things, attitudes, opinions, and thoughts. Do you know or rather, have you observed that you identify with your opinions? This is another form of identifying with oneself. Of course, an opinion is not you, but quite distinct. But if you are identified, the feeling of I becomes fastened to it. Perhaps you feel you do not have opinions. In any case, we all have thoughts. Can you say I to your thoughts? Or rather, do you say I to them invariably? Certainly, if you believe that everything in your inner world is I, then you cannot help doing so. But you might as well say that everything in the external world is yourself. Often, very depressing and complex thoughts come. If one identifies with them, they exert their full power. Then one is identified with one's thoughts. But it is quite possible not to identify with one's thoughts. In fact, it is very necessary to learn this and as soon as possible. It helps one a great deal in work on oneself and in every way. It is impossible to stop thoughts. You can try this, but merely as an exercise in self-observation. But one can learn not to identify with thoughts and one must begin by observing them. Some thoughts are very interesting to observe, tangled, complex, heavy thoughts that it is very dangerous to identify with. If you do not identify with something in yourself, you begin to be free from its power. Next time we will speak more of identifying with oneself in regard to the intellectual center and later in regard to the other centers. <laughs>